fast forward a few years to Rascal Flats. Mm -hmm. You're, this would be like the next big, humongous mega band that that you produce. How did that come about working with Rascal Flats? Because you you were there from the very beginning with those guys, right? I put the band together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was like right up at the. Well, I had continued to work uh, at EMI Music Publishing as a staff producer. Um, and uh, A&R guy for the publishing company. Uh, but uh, after Blackhawk, my, my, my head had grown to enormous proportions <laughs> to where I couldn't fit into most doors. <laughs> and, and, and in the course of that, proceeded to ruin several careers along the way. Um, so in 98, uh, I was invited to leave EMI. <laughs> and, uh, and this was a very sobering point. Uh, aspect and um, time of my life, um, I thought, "Oh boy, what am I going? What am I going to do?" Well, a couple of weeks weeks after that, Donna Hilly, who was running Sony ATV Tree, uh, said, uh, "Asked me to um, come join a, uh, uh, to come start a joint venture with her." And mm -hmm. she had been she she never spoke to me before that. It's like this wow. woman I thought hated me, um, but she kept her eyes on everybody, and like we were. Uh, Sony ATV Tree was a big competitor of EMI's, and they had Don Cook, a real well-known, great producer, right. through, all through the '90s. And he, his career, he wanted to really start retiring and backing off. So she offered me this joint venture, and um, I'm going to get the Rascal Flats yeah. in a second. Um, but I signed this this little this young bloke who had had a, a record deal on Arista, and um, and he had a because he'd gotten that record deal, EMI paid him this big, huge publishing advance. So he'd gotten advance money from the record company. It was heirs to careers record back in those mm -hmm. days with that imprint. And uh, he was getting a six-figure publishing salary. Well, it tanked. So EMI dropped him immediately. Um, and I had seen this him slowly, his, his songwriting improving, um, sort of exponentially, and I thought, you know, I'm, he's going to be my first writer. I'm going to sign it. I'm going to sign that kid. So um, I signed him in um, 99, 1999. You're and, fixing to blow one of my later questions. But, oh, I'm but so go sorry. ahead. <laughs> I am so sorry. But it, it's chronologically. It's yeah. the, um, signed him, and, and about a month after I signed him, he came to me and said, um, I need to go. I've got my father worked out worked it out for me to go back to med school, which he had stopped before to write, and it didn't work out. He says, "But I promise you, I'll write every day. I'll bring my buddies down to write with me." And I said, "Oh, great! My first signing is going to go back to med school. <laughs> this is perfect. This is so my life." Um, so he, he made good on it, and he he um, in our first year of of this publishing joint venture called Terrace Music, he got. 44 songs recorded and that writer was Brett James yeah uh, and it was just unbelievable to the success he uh, he uh, attained early on and continues to attain did he make day. it to med school or he he, he quit again for the yeah. second time and yeah. and uh, after after he got the one of his early cuts was a it wasn't a single but it was a song that was on Faith Hill's Breathe album that sold 11 million records. Yeah. Oh, man, we were rocking and rolling. That yeah. mechanical royalty back in those days was yeah. huge. Um, so that was, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, oh, no, Clay, no, to, to mess that up. <laughs> um, but uh, so this publishing company was um, doing really well right off the bat. Um, this uh, artist at the time on Atlantic Records named Myla Mason came to me and said, these these guys there's these guys are playing in this, this pickup kind of band on Printer's Alley, um, and uh, you ought to go see them. I'm like, yeah, right, Myla, great, you know. <laughs> and she, she like I think she came back to my doorway three different times saying, "You have got to go hear these guys. The lead singer is weirdly great." And I go see him at the, whatever the fiddle and steel guitar bar yeah. I think is what it's called, and I saw him and. There were like six guys up there, and, and I, but I'm thinking, well, they're good, but I don't know who's doing what. So the next day, I said, "Come to my office, let's talk." These six guys show up, and and uh, I uh, 
And so three of the guys were sort of talking to me. The other ones were lo- kind of looking out the window or looked like they were sort of a pseudo security guard kind of deal. It was weird. And uh, so I got a sense of the room and, uh, and I said, okay, you three come back tomorrow. The rest of you guys, you know, it's nice to meet you. So you're back to another trio. Right. Black Hawk was yeah. a trio. And, uh, and so uh, they came back and uh, we started. Uh, so I signed them to a production deal, signed them to a publishing deal, also signed on to manage them. And uh, uh, that was Rascal Flats. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was a quick ride to the top. I, we recorded three original songs for. Um, to, to get them to, to secure a record deal. Uh, and I, I had some buddies, my peers back in those days, that we'd all play each other's stuff. So one of my close friends was Dan Huff. Went over to his house one day and said, so, so what are you working on? I said, well, these, these three young guys. Um, and they really wanted to make a bluegrass record, but, you know. Well, in fact, that first cassette that was going around on the three sides you cut, they sounded a little bluegrassy. Mm-hmm. And... Somebody had asked me, well, maybe you should write with these guys, and it sounded bluegrassy. And I was like, mm, I don't get it. You know, it's like, it shows the difference between me and you. Totally, but you know, um, but you know, the, but Gary was an arm, a white, yeah. a blue-eyed R and B. I just didn't hear you know? it on that original, right? Because thing. Yeah. because they were playing you know mandolins and all this stuff, yeah. and, and uh, so I said, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not interested in making a bluegrass record with you, but. I'll make a country record, you know, so that's how it all worked out. So I was at Dan's house, and I, I played him the three sides. He was like, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. He goes, I want a friend of mine to listen to it. And I said, before I could say who, he was on the fo- phone talking to Doug Howard at Lyric Street. Mm-hmm. I go in later that afternoon. I get to call the guys and say, you got to get together, put on some some nice-looking clothes. Don't stink. Take a shower. And... Um, <laughs> And we go over to Lyric Street and and just blew Doug Howard away. And his boss, Randy Goodman, was out of town at Hilton Head. He called him on the spot there with us in the room. Said, "Randy, you got to come back early. Just, we've got we've got our act. We've got the wow. you know." Randy comes back, so we do the whole process again. Make him take showers, use some deodorant, <laughs> come in, and you know they just killed it. And they had they got the deal. 